Hi, I'm Bob Doyle, the Information Philosopher, webcasting to you from my ITV studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And our lecture today on Wednesday will be on philosophers and scientists. And we've chosen as our scientist, really our philosopher today, Robert Kane. Kane is the leading libertarian thinker uh, among the dozens and dozens of philosophers who try to deal with the problem of free will and moral responsibility. And for a long time, I identified him as the leading libertarian uh, because he was uh, one of the few who adopted some of the ideas of scientists who had considered um, the role of quantum physics and indeterminism in uh, creating a break with past uh, deterministic laws of physics, the classical mechanics laws. And so Kane has always seemed to be on the leading edge of those thinking about this problem. For example, one of uh, the comparison philosophers I chose in my book uh, was Dan Dennett. And Dan Dennett has a wonderful two-stage model, but uh, his model does not include uh, quantum indeterminism. Uh, so let's take a look at my book on um, free will because Kane is, as I say, one of the leaders in free will. And we'll start with a, a view of, the, of this book. Let's start with a big picture here on my desktop where I'm working in my studio. Here I have Bob Kane's page on my Information Philosopher website and um, on the back screen, uh, other possibilities of things that we'll be going to look at. But for now, I'd like to take a look at this, this book. And it's chapter 24 of the book uh, on Robert Gaines libertarianism that I'd like to begin with today. So I write that I regard him as the acknowledged dean of the libertarian philosophers actively writing on the free will problem uh, today. In the first half of the 20th century, many Anglo-American philosophers had largely dismissed libertarian free will as what uh, Wittgenstein and some others had called a pseudo-problem. In addition, when Cain began work in the 1960s, most philosophers and scientists thought free will was compatible with determinism, or perhaps impossible because of determinism. Uh, Cain developed the Aristotelian view that even if most of our actions are in fact determined entirely by our character, these actions could be considered free if at times we are in the past, uh, at times in the past we had freely created our own character. And if we remain free to change it, of course, with what we he calls self forming actions, or SFAs. So Keynes' model is designed to provide an agent with what he calls ultimate responsibility, based on the idea of a self-forming action. Keynes' importance in the history of the free will problem is fourfold. First, he has an event causal free will model, which is to say he thinks it's all explanatory in terms of events happening in the world. Others who wanted to argue for libertarian freedom insisted that it be the agent who be considered the causal uh, force behind uh, uh, the agent's action. So his Keynes event causal free will model has in recent years been the libertarian model most often discussed and the one against which other models are compared frequently. So that's the first reason I think he's very important. Second, his prolific writing has produced several important books on free will and ethics. His editing has given us a free will anthology and the massive Oxford Handbook of Free Will. Thirdly, he's mentored many of the current participants in the free will debate. So you'll often find that people writing have studied with Kane or been really influenced by Kane. But for me, the fourth reason that Kane is critically important is because he's one of the very few thinkers to find a place for quantum indeterminacy in a free will model. Um, speaking of the Oxford Handbook of Free Will, I just thought I'd show you uh, a look at that book. Um, this actually 
is the second edition. Let me back up a little bit because this is a very big book. Uh, I can't even fit it all in with that position, so we'll come back a little farther. And here this Oxford Handbook <coughs> is the paperback second edition. Cain did this work first uh, back uh, 10 years earlier in the early 1990s. This is the, um, I guess, uh, or more near the end of the 1990s. This second edition came out in 2011. And I was pleased to have already uh, known Cain at this time. Uh, and in his introduction to the book, uh, he, he says, let me go back into my close-up view for that moment. See that at the base of this prior page, we see more recently, if you can read that, a deliberative EC, ease, that's the event causal view, has been uh, defined, he says, defended by me <laughs> in a, a book that was to come out and in an article I guess I had written in 2010, who I call a two-stage model of libertarian freedom, an indeterministic stage in which the various considerations come to mind, influencing choice, followed by a determined stage, I call it adequately determined, uh, in which the agent exercises control over which choice is made in light of those considerations. Today I call those alternative possibilities following the ideas of William James. Doyle argues that such a deliberative, event-causal, libertarian view was prefigured by William James, among other thinkers. So this enormous uh, collection of articles, uh, dozens and dozens of thinkers, uh, makes to me makes Cain uh, one of the great uh, contributors to the free will uh, problem. And that's why I included his work in one chapter of my book called The Scandal in Philosophy. Now a large part of the scandal had to do with the important connection uh, between the idea that moral responsibility, or what Cain called ultimate responsibility, has to do with the question of whether or not we have free will. That is to say that we are free um, not just from coercive uh, forces that prevent us from acting, which has traditionally been called freedom of action, but true freedom of will, uh, freedom of thought. We can come up with new ideas and we can act on those ideas. So Cain definitely is in this camp that he believes we have this libertarian free will as opposed to thinking that everything we do is something that's happening to us. So let me go to my Cain uh, page on, on an information philosopher. Here's a picture that I took of Bob at the Harvard Faculty Club when he came to uh, stay for a couple of days in Boston and uh, made a video of the uh, chapter in, in the, uh, his Oxford Handbook. Uh, let's come back to that for just a moment, see if I can find this. Um, I guess he says at the bottom, let's come back in again, because this was an important moment in my own studies of this problem. Here, the yellowed area, here's Cain talking, and he says, my own essay in part six Rethinking Free Will, New Perspectives on an Ancient Problem. And then he discusses the idea of centering randomness in the middle of the decision. That is to say, free will that places indeterminism in the choices or decisions themselves. Now, uh, he believes that no such view, and indeed his no event causal view of any kind, played a significant role in free will debates prior to the 1960s when I first began developing such a view. So a little technical uh, commentary there, but what Bob is saying is that uh, he's going to push the indeterministic randomness right into the moment of the decision, which to me is a rather controversial thing to do. And uh, he Traditionally, one attacks the notion that if there's any chance involved in the middle of a decision, that that makes the decision 
a random one and uh, questions whether one can uh, claim responsibility. Uh, we'll come to this later, but tell you quickly, Kane's position is that if the choices that are available, if the possibilities, uh, William James would say the alternative possibilities are all indeed quite good choices, and they're just so close to one another that one's faced with what Bob calls a torn decision. You're torn between A and B or A and B and C, so that there, there arises in the mind, according to Bob's neuroscientific thinking, a kind of a tension and, and, um, and pressures and forces that lead to indeterminism coming up and affecting which of the possibilities becomes the chosen one, at which point Bob says that agent has gone with one rather than the other and therefore bears responsibility for the choice even though it was indeterministic. That gets into some complexities which we will come back to later. Um, but let me uh, go back to my, uh, let's put it up on the screen, my web page on Bob. So as uh, I guess I had said that, that uh, the uh, situation in the 1960s uh, had been uh, free will considered either deterministic, compatible, or um, unintelligible according to uh, Bob, uh, but, the, but also dismissed by language philosophers as a pseudo problem. It's really just a problem in how we're formulating our, our language and our ability to describe what's going on. Now I find this is rather similar to uh, discussions going on in quantum mechanics when Niels Bohr insisted that the, the great problem uh, in understanding or interpreting quantum mechanics uh, has to do with the language that we have to use, which is a language that's uh, based in classical mechanical concepts. Uh, so language played a great role at the early uh, 20th century and it came through to even the 1960s when, uh, when Bob Kane started to think about this problem. So here's his lecture called Free Will, New Perspectives, which was the chapter uh, six of this uh, book. Uh, when Bob came to Cambridge and stayed at the faculty club, that's a picture of him in front of the faculty club, I made this recording. And what I'd like to do is bring it up on another screen here and uh, take this full screen and show you what I did to record uh, his thinking. Let's see if I can bring that over to the full screen and uh, see if I have the closed captions on and just roll about five minutes of his introduction to how it is he came into the uh, space of working on the free will problem. Robert Kane, professor of philosophy at the University of Texas in Austin, delivering a lecture on free will, new perspectives on an ancient problem. My dealings with free will date back to the mid-1960s and are coterminous with a resurgence of interest among philosophers in problems about the freedom of the will that began in the decade of the 1960s. The landscape of the free will issue was very uh, much simpler then. The unstated assumption was that if you had scientific leanings, you should be a compatibilist about free will, believing it to be compatible with determinism. That is, you should be a compatibilist if you did not deny we had free will altogether, as did skeptics and hard determinists. And if you were a libertarian about free will, believing in a free will that is incompatible with determinism, you must, in order to make sense of such a free will, inevitably appeal to uncaused causes, immaterial minds, numinal cells, non-event causes, prime movers unmoved, and other examples of what P.F. Strawson called the panicky metaphysics of libertarianism in his influential 1962 essay, Freedom and Resentment. So let me pause here and um, see where Bob has situated his own thinking. It's in a time when people either were what he called hard determinists, uh, that was a phrase originated way back in the 19th century by William James. 
and, and they simply argued that the laws of science, uh, whether physics, chemistry, biology, or whatever, all were laws in, and, and brooked no exceptions. So uh, one thought, hum human beings are the consequence of causal laws determining everything we do. On the other hand, William James had come up with a phrase called soft determinism, in which uh, people argued, well, we may be determined because the overarching view of the world, whether it's a religious view of an omnipotent God or the uh, universal laws of nature, which since they applied to the universe as a whole, surely they apply to human beings as well. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as long as we aren't being locked up in a jail somewhere so we have a freedom of action, uh, maybe this is good enough because in particular a certain event that causes us to think in a certain way it at least puts us in the path of the causal chain and we are therefore responsible for what comes later after we have, to have this thought or make this choice. Uh, James thought that was very uh, unacceptable, uh, a, a wretched uh, subterfuge, uh, making us, uh, um, uh, you know, words, word play, uh, games in order to, to convince ourselves that we have this freedom, which for James, uh, he thought clearly that Darwinian evolution had, had given us a picture in which new events occurred that were not predictable by prior uh, events and somehow involved chance. Something that Darwin probably did think, although the term was an offensive term to religious ears in the, in the mid-19th century and Darwin's wife was particularly concerned about talking about chance because of its atheistical implications that things were happening in the world that God could not know if they were genuine chance, ontological chance, as opposed to chance as ignorance, human ignorance, which was the standard view of what chance and games of chance were all about. They were just things that we didn't know completely. Otherwise, they could be known completely, in particular by God, was the thought in those days. <clears throat> so here we see uh, Bob Kane mentioning uh, P.F. Strawson, his famous essay called Freedom and Resentment which started off with a set of thinking, a, a kind of new kind of compatibilism that said, well, we really can't answer this question of the role of physics and events and causal chains in uh, our minds uh, and whether we're free, uh, have a free will or are determinist, determined. Uh, for Strawson, he said he wanted to set that aside. He said he really, uh, I'm not sure he said this uh, seriously, but he said, it's not a problem I understand, but what Strawson did understand is that uh, we have what David Hume had called the moral sentiments, and those led us to feel in certain ways unquestionably the case, no matter whether determinism was true or free will was true, and it was those moral sentiments which led us to have attitudes about the actions of others and our own actions, and that led us to uh, led Strawson to think that uh, we could we could feel resentment, and when we feel resentment, uh, it's, it tells us we have a kind of freedom uh, that's based on our feelings and our emotions and our fundamental he fundamental morality. Uh, so now we can come back to uh, to Bob Kane and notice that he is one of the uh, philosophers who does not separate free will from moral responsibility in a serious way. Uh, so let me switch to uh, this view of my web page. And I write here, since his earliest book, and let me bring that to full screen for you, Free Will and Values, Cain has focused on free choices that have moral or prudential significance, as well as those with merely practical significance. And he accepts two-stage models of free will as relevant to practical choices, but thinks something more is needed for moral choices, which are the grounds for his character developing, self-forming willings initially called them, or self-forming uh, actions. So I'm going to argue that he doesn't strictly separate the problem of free will from moral responsibility. 
uh, although we could say, um, you know, here I write, he, he conflates the two when he describes moral responsibility as the traditional definition of free will, and he describes what he calls ultimate responsibility as the basis for free will, okay? But let's come back to his book a uh, moment, and I'd like to show you that book, because it's, it's a, a landmark. Uh, let me move this one away and bring in 1985. Several books, actually, I'd like to show you. Uh, Bob Kane's book, I need to back up our picture a little bit, maybe around here, Free Will and Values by Rob, Robert Kane. And it's, it's rather interesting that on his cover, Bob introduced in 1985 a kind of a metaphor for whether or not we are free, which is quite clearly on the side of determinism. Here's this puppeteer, well, a puppet, uh, the puppeteer is implied for coming from above, um, and one might say that fits with a kind of religious view of God willing, things happen because God is willing, and so forth. Uh, and that cover turned out to be rather significant uh, in recent years. Uh, here's a cover from uh, the work of Michael Gazzaniga uh, that I've studied and have a nice web page on him, a brilliant neuroscientist who is comfortable with the idea that we're not in charge, that someone else is in charge, and we'll, or some other process is in charge. Uh, here's a very popular book by Sam Harris. On, when you search free will in Google, this book comes up first. Sometimes my website on information philosophy position on free will comes up as well on that first Google search page. Uh, the two-stage model that I just referred to is, of course, the model which I f discovered or tried to develop back in the 1970s, uh, and subsequent research found it in the work of Dan Dennett and uh, some others that Dan had cited, uh, David Wiggins, Arthur Holly Compton, the physicist uh, who explicitly involved uh, quantum indeterminacy, and I then found that it was a story told by William James, so I always describe the free will two-stage model as beginning with William James. And here's a great religious uh, theologian philosopher uh, in, in England, and once again, here's uh, the, uh, not exactly a puppet here, what we have is pictures of a human being cutting away the strings uh, that are presumed to have tied him in modern science. Swinburne is kind of opposed to materialist, reductive, uh, scientific uh, views that uh, we are just physical objects and it can be controlled by physical laws. So, on, let's see if I can remember where uh, Bob's work is here. Uh, let's see, Popper, right. Here, um, Bob is talking about the work of um, that, that the, the, what, what I call a two-stage model, and he described as, in an important sentence, deliberation always works by trial and error, or more precisely, by the method of trial and of error elimination by tentatively proposing various possibilities and eliminating those that do not seem adequate. That was uh, citing the work of Karl Popper, another one of the or origins uh, of that idea that I too cite. Um, and then he says this theme has been pursued by a number of thinkers, and mo most recently by Daniel Dennett in his important work, Brainstorms. And Brainstorms uh, does indeed uh, have a wonderful account, which I can bring in, uh, past, peek at it later, um, in which Quint Dennett uh, approves the, the claim that the essence of invention is the intelligent selection from among chance generated candidates. Okay? To go, and he goes on to suggest a model of decision making based on this idea. And it turns out Dennett's idea was an idea that was uh, very well known in the work of uh, uh, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon. 
Uh, and he then it proposes this model as something that libertarians should be willing to accept. And uh, Bob Keane said he agreed, but with the proviso that such a model is only directly relevant to context of practical decision making. Okay. Moral and prudential choice, as I have emphasized, must be treated differently. Now, I really need to kind of discuss this uh, because, uh, for starters, I'm happy uh, that, we'll bring this one up again, uh, that Cain is accepting of um, practical significance uh, would be okay for two-stage models. Because uh, what that does, as I see it, is the Cain can agree and accept the idea that most of our decisions that are free decisions uh, are uh, practically free and apply to our practical choices. Now, the question of why we move to include moral responsibility uh, is an historically very important one. Bob Kane is a, a theor an ethical theorist, and he's very interested in the human problem of how it is we decide between good and evil, how it is we choose between good and evil, how it is, in particular, that human beings form their character so as to be uh, considered to be good or considered to be evil. Uh, and he lets that come into his work to the extent that, uh, as I say here, he needs something more uh, for moral choices. And those are the grounds for what he describes a self-forming action. Um, oops, I guess I just hit a wrong link there for a moment and see if I can get back. Here we are. So like most philosophers, Cain does not separate free will from moral responsibility. He describes um, uh, these two as the traditional definition of free will and he describes his ultimate responsibility. Now my position is that uh, whether or not we're predetermined okay, by the laws of nature, cannot be shown by arguing words that uh, it must be a matter of our behavior being considered moral or immoral. Uh, the question of whether we're free to do what we do is a question of whether the laws of physics, chemistry, biology coming up from below are constraining and causing our, our actions. If Cain accepts the idea that uh, our practical decisions can be thought of as initially generating alternative possibilities and involving in some cases quantum physics. So the indeterminism is deep and ontological and not a matter of ignorance. Uh, then I believe he is, accepts a two-stage model for that reason. Uh, Kane then traces his ideas back through Daniel Dennett, Karl Popper, as we just saw. Let me see if I can make this a little larger so you can see it. And uh, they even be traced earlier to Bertrand Russell and Arthur Stanley Eddington all the way to Epicurus, who basically uh, first argued that a swerve of an atom could play a role in breaking away from the idea that everything is determined by laws of nature. So here on my webpage, I have another presentation that Bob made at a conference in Barcelona in 2010. Uh, called Can Libertarian Free Will Be Made Consistent with something or other, uh, science. Uh, we were invited to a conference uh, on the question of uh, what science has to say about the um, question of free will. And a, this book was published including Bob's work and mine and, and, and others who were there including Martin Heisenberg and Al Mealy. So what I'd like to do here is switch over to this screen where I just completed uh, the, the lecture given or the talk given by Bob in my lab. This is my bookshelf behind him. Uh, and I'd like to switch to the, uh, the talk that he gave in Barcelona. Let's see what I have here. Right. I think this is the place we want to start. Let me just check my notes. We should be wanting to start around four. In. So let's try this. I'll bring him to full screen and I'll press play.
and see if I've got my sound level up properly and we'll listen to Bob talk about the process by, and how he came to work on his ultimate responsibility. This basic line of reasoning identified by Aristotle and which is the basis for the condition of ultimate responsibility lies behind our everyday judgments about responsibility. In fact, I find it to be absolutely fundamental and essential. The condition of uh, you are, this condition, has numerous implications for free will. For example, it doesn't require that we could have done otherwise for every act done of our own free wills, as we often use that expression. But it does require that we could have done otherwise with respect to some acts in our past life histories by which we formed our present characters. I call these self-forming actions or SFAs. Bob uh, has uh, mentioned them. Often we act from a will already formed, but it's our own free will by virtue of the fact that we formed it by other choices or actions in the past, self-forming actions or SFAs, as I call them, for which we could have done otherwise. Think again here of the drunk driver. If this were not so, there's nothing we could have ever done differently in our entire lifetimes to make ourselves different than we are. A consequence, I believe, that's incompatible with our being at least some, to some degree ultimately responsible for what we are, and that's what I think free will requires. Ewell also tells us why the traditional problem of free will was about the freedom of the will and not merely about freedom of action. The modern era since the 17th century, as I note, has tried to obscure the difference thereby oversimplifying the problem. The medievals had a better idea on this one, and here I kind of take issue with, with John Locke uh, uh, on this. Free will, uh, as traditionally understood, was something deeper than freedom of action. It was about self-formation, or how we got to be the kinds of persons we are. Uh, it'd be interesting, I think, to tie this to larger story about the disenchantments of modernity, but I'll forego that. And finally, UI tells us why free will has traditionally been thought to be incompatible with determinism. If agents have to be responsible to some degree for anything such as their prior formed character and motives, that's a sufficient cause or motive for their actions, an impossible infinite regress of past actions would be required unless some actions in an agent's life history, self-forming actions, did not have either sufficient cause, causes or motives and hence were undetermined. This rethinking of the traditional problem in terms of UR doesn't make the free will problem any easier. In fact, it makes it a heck of a lot harder. How can actions lacking both sufficient causes and motives be free and responsible actions? And how would, if at all, could such actions exist in the natural order without reducing to either chance or luck? Now, as Bob Doyle notes in, in his instructive and insightful presentation of the recent history of these debates, I believe early on that quantum theory must have something to do with the solution to these problems, but it was really difficult to say what. For most scientists and philosophers had scoffed at suggestions by Compton and Eddington and other people that Bob mentioned uh, that quantum theory made room for free will. That was too simple. Uh, if a choice were to occur as a result of some undetermined quantum events in the brain, the skeptics argued, how could that amount to a free and responsible choice? In fact, the consensus view was that indeterminism in the brain would not enhance freedom and responsibility, but diminish it. Uh, as Bob also notes in his presentation, my first efforts at dealing with this problem in the 70s was to formulate a two-stage model, very much like the one he nicely presents and that Al uh, put forward later and, and, and so on. Um, I thought from the beginning that this must be part of the solution to the free will problem. I initially got onto it through Popper, who was one of the guys that mentioned, who was giving the Compton lecture and went back to Compton too, and I knew uh, Compton's son. Uh, that's another long story, but I'll forego it. Uh, I, um, I thought from the beginning that it must be part of the problem, uh, but uh, I also believe it could not be the complete solution, and here I take some issue with Bob, Bob although I agree a lot with a lot of what he has to say and also with Al. Um, uh, hence, I didn't publish anything about it in the 70s because I figured I haven't got the whole solution yet. I just got a part of it. How can you publish a part of it? Uh, and, and, and then it turned out that Dennett published this article in 78 that Bob mentioned, and I was really distressed because I needed an article to get tenure. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, damn it. I said, I didn't think it was good enough. And even Dennett, of course, he wasn't an incompatible. As Dennett said, uh, well, here's what libertarians can have this. But uh, it's not all they want, right? And that's what you, you said too, Al. Uh, and so I didn't publish it because I said, well, I haven't got the whole story yet. And then he published it, and damn it, he got tenure, I guess. Uh, 
So uh, you know how that you all know how that is, and uh, young fellows in here are worried about that. Uh, but uh, okay, um, and uh, and Dennett also believed it was not all that libertarians wanted, but at least provided something. And uh, Al Mealy took the same view uh, somewhat later, and I think they're both correct in that. Uh, and so I made the two-stage model a part of my own theory in, 19, in a 1985 book, uh, but only a part, and I tried to go beyond it. And this is where it gets dicey. Uh, I'm even more... Indeed, it does get dicey at this point. Uh, but here, I hope we've gotten an insight into how um, Bob Kane viewed his work and how he worked through many of the philosophers who had an idea for either the contribution of quantum randomness to creating a break in the deterministic causal chain of events, which would be a kind of necessary precondition before we had a human being doing something that was not determined in the sense of predetermined from long before they began to think about it. Uh, if every single event was causally connected to every previous event, we have complete what, what William James called hard determinism. So James had introduced the concept of some chance. Uh, there was no real uh, belief uh, of existence of any chance in the 19th century. It only came into our thinking with uh, the discovery of quantum indeterminism, uh, which most people, including myself, traced to the work of, of Werner Heisenberg in the 1920s. Uh, that's the work on the uncertainty principle which Arthur Stanley Eddington cited as, as producing a little break in the chain and, and therefore opening the door to some human freedom. Uh, I've shown in my other work, and in my Friday lectures on Albert Einstein, it's a major important uh, issue that Einstein had discovered ontological chance 10 years before uh, Werner Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in Einstein's uh, 1916 article, he said there's something wrong with the theory. Well, he called it a weakness in the theory because it apparently introduces chance into physics. Uh, very important element of my attempt to recover the uh, original contributions to quantum physics by Albert Einstein. But coming back to Bob Kane in the 1970s, uh, when he began, I began my work a little earlier, but I had it no, not so clearly formulated and sir, not uh, carefully distinguished from other positions as William James did, hard determinism, soft determinism, freedom, human freedom, and so forth. And today we have a massive taxonomy of so many different positions. Uh, but <clears throat> Bob said uh, the Brainstorm book by... Um, Dan Dennett was, was a very important thing because he read there uh, what he himself had been thinking about. Now, that's very interesting because I was working along the very same path. I was familiar with some of the others, like Arthur Harley Compton, who decided a quantum event could be the beginnings of an explanation for free will. It's not a complete uh, description, as Bob says, because uh, if it's a random event in the brain, and you do something random as a consequence of a random event or a quantum event in the brain, it's hard to believe that you can take responsibility for that. Uh, if it was a bad event, it was a random event. You can go to the judge, as they say, and say, I have nothing to do with it. It was a total random event. Um, so let's take a look uh, briefly at, um, at uh, the Brainstorm's book of um, Dan Dennett. Let's see what I've got here. Hard to see where his name is. There he is, Daniel Dennett and Brainstorms. Um, see if I can find the page. Cogetville model. Um, I guess it's not, not there. It's at a later place in the book. Yes, as, as Bob Kane just told us, Dan had suggested this. Um, in, uh, as, as an idea of giving libertarians what they say they want. That's a very nice idea. And um, he set it up um, where he thought at the time uh, we have compatibilism and it's the strategic favorite. So that's William James' 
soft determinism, but we must admit that no compatibilism free of problems while full of the traditional flavors of responsibility has yet been devised. Uh, now that's very interesting because I'm sure uh, Bob Kane felt the same uh, situation uh, in, in 1978. And so he went on to work in his uh, book called Free Will and Values in 1985. Um, I think there's a, a nice section in here of, of the book. It's on my web page. Uh, first is the idea, why did he call this Valerian? Um, a Valerian model, because he cited the poet Paul Valéry, which uh, Bob mentioned also. It captures the idea that it takes two to invent anything, okay? The one makes up combinations. The other one chooses, recognizes what he wishes and what is important to him in the mass of the things which the former has imparted to him. What we call genius is much less the work of the first than the readiness of the second one to grasp the value of what has been laid before him and to choose it. So here, says Dennett, and this is a wonderful key description of the problem, we have the suggestion of an intelligent selection. And that, of course, is like Darwinian selection, but in this case, it's an intelligence doing the selecting from what may be a partially arbitrary or chaotic or random production. And what we need is the outline of a model for such a process in human decision making. Okay? And I think uh, we eventually get to uh, several reasons why this is a good idea. His model of decision making. Um, has the following feature. When we're faced with an important decision, a consideration generator produces some considerations. And then he explains first, second, third, all the good reasons why this is a good model. Uh, I think the second one is perhaps most interesting. Then it says, I think it installs indeterminism in the right place for the libertarian, if there is a right place at all. And Dan is skeptical because to, to this day he prefers the notion that everything is determined, but that as long as we are able to be free from constraints like physical constraints, and secondly, secondly as long as we're able to um, uh, be responsible uh, action, uh, agents, responsible moral agents, he calls it having moral competence. He thinks that is traditionally connected to free will. Free will is often described as the precondition that makes moral responsibility possible. And what, what Dan Dennett does with this is to say that that moral competence can be regarded as a kind of free will, and it's the kind of free will worth wanting, as he described in his uh, books uh, Elbow, Elbow Room and, um, and Freedom Evolves, which just a quick look at these two books. Uh, there's Elbow Room and his more, more popular, I guess, well-known Freedom Evolves. Dan and Bob are two of the most important thinkers in this field. Uh, I made them the subject of two of the chapters in my book, Free Will. The third was on uh, a, a hard determinist, self-described, Ted Hondrich, uh, who uh, for years ran the Institute of Philosophy in uh, London, uh, originally founded by Bertrand Russell. And the other was Alfred Mealy. And Al Mealy was at this conference uh, at which Bob is speaking right here. And I have a little bit of uh, quibbling back and forth between Bob and Al and myself uh, when I was trying to describe the role of that indeterminism, the role of that chance. And at the time, Bob was a little worried about that chance of getting too close to being centered in the decision, and it might cause the action to be at random. Uh, I thought I might just play a little bit of that uh, exchange. So let me go from here for a moment, see if I can find this section. Here on the screen is um, a fellow named Russell Wilcox, who is trying to get a sense of what is the two-stage model. So let's uh, open this to full screen and let's listen to this for just a couple of minutes. Second stage of your two-stage process. In the first stage, the randomly generated possibilities. Right. If I've understood it correctly. That's right. And these are quantum, quantum. Only in order to be free of the rejections that the universe has determined us to be what we want to be. It second, could be another kind of random. So the second stage is, is in a sense, 
thinking about these possibilities and going around, right, and 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 fastening on one rather than the other. Yeah. Now the fastening. Yes. Is that a quantum event? No. no. It's a random. It's not a random. No, event. no, no. The randomness has generated what our is possibility. Consistent? This one, uh, but Bob Kane has a bigger level answer, and that has to do with the responsibility yeah, issue. Well, no, there's, there's something got to be very clear on here, and that is between the time when the last uh, uh, undetermined new idea comes and the choice is made, there's going to have to be some time gap there. Yeah. And between those two, it's determined. It's that's part of the two-stage model. You can't get away from it. <coughs> so you have these ideas, and you might bring it right up close and whatever, but it's still going to be determined. There's going to be a determined gap right in there, which means that the choice finally made is going to depend on chance events that came to your mind over which you didn't have control, which of them came to your mind. That's going to be determined by that. Right. That's my problem. Right. Notice how weird that is with a moral choice, which I mentioned yesterday in connection with, I forget which. Uh, imagine a moral choice in which you are going to decide whether to murder or not to murder on the basis of which chance events comes to your mind. Mm -hmm. That's my problem. That's Keynes I, I, That's why I think it can work with practical reasoning, but it has to get into real problems with morality. With morality, right? Yeah. Okay, we're, we're in the subject. So I'm going to just pause here for a moment because here's Bob Kane and I was off screen to the left and this is our host who organized the conference, Antoine Suarez. O off to Antoine's right, um, or to his left as we're looking to the right of Antoine, uh, uh, Al Mealy is there and he sort of takes issue with where uh, Bob Kane is going here in criticizing the two-stage model. Uh, let's see if we can uh, hear what that uh, was said. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Bob Kane's being unfair to the two-stage model. So I like that. I like that little section. Bob Kane is being unfair to the two-stage model. Uh, let's listen to that again. No problems with morality. With morality, right? Yeah. Okay, we're we're in a subject. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Bob Kane's being unfair to the two-stage model. So at any moment until you make the judgment about what's right. best, something might come to mind. What is the last moment? Mm -hmm. um, well, <laughs> but the moment it comes to mind. In other words, if, for example, you're thinking you're going to murder, and then at the very moment a new thought comes and you don't, that thought just came. It was undetermined. It isn't like you decided not to. When prior you did, and you, you, you decided not to because a thought came to your mind, and if it didn't, that was pure no, chance, no. So whether it came or not. Mind, and you get to assess it, you keep thinking. Well, it, well then, in that thinking, is, it's determined. So it's still determined by the last one, whether it's at the last moment or no, several seconds earlier. It's not determined, because the shape... Well, the yeah, in other words, your thinking is not determined. Yeah. Okay, so well, then, then, then you've got a model like mine. This is important, because, Peter. Because my no, thinking so this is, so this is, I'm sorry. So as I uh, try to say there, this is important, Peter, because we're homing in on whether or not a new thought, which is, occurs to someone at the last possible moment, uh, is determinative of the new action. Now, Bob is right in one sense, and I think uh, Al Mealy in the back is saying, no, it really isn't, uh, and here's the way it goes. For Al Mealy, he's saying the new thought appears at the moment, it is then evaluated compared to the previous set of thoughts which were still not being resolved in the form of a decision. And so it includes the second stage in Al's version. He says, you're not being fair to the two-stage model. The new idea is just another contributing alternative possibility, as James would call it. And if it's genuinely random, as Bob, I think, agrees with me, uh, it then is a free thought. It doesn't mean that because we now choose it and go with it, that that has in any way uh, contaminated, so to speak, our action and made it somehow a random action. Uh, I'd like to show you a, um, a diagram and see if I can figure out where this is uh, <clears throat> on another screen. Let's see, I will drive to free will here. And not quite sure where I can find it, so give me just another moment.
go to information philosopher and we'll go to Bob Kane. Let me show you the screen I'm working on. This is my book screen, but I want to scroll down to Bob Kane's page, which I guess I have that page uh, over here. So let's come over to this one. Excuse my clumsiness. But as I scroll through the Kane page, I believe I had a, a very long discussion of his ultimate responsibility and alternative possibilities. Uh, my goodness, this is a huge page. But somewhere in here, I believe I produced a, a description of what... No, I'm not going to find it very quickly. <laughs> no. And, okay, no, I'm not getting there. My apologies, I'll come back to uh, my own, mm, over to this screen, and we'll try free will, and we'll go to the cogito model, which is a name I gave to my free will model some time ago. And I think we'll eventually find the diagrams I'm looking for here. There we go. So what the picture of free will was, uh, let me bring that up to our main screen. The picture of free will that people had before Bob Kane, and then, then it suggested this way of thinking about one step and another step. It was always thought that the decision was just something made as a consequence of the fixed past, and it determined the future. The decision determined the future. The decision was itself determined by the fixed past. The last thing that just happened before the decision was causal, and it seemed as if Bob was getting into that possibility in that discussion in Barcelona. So the two-stage model is basically saying, well, um, instead of the fixed past, going quickly to the decision, what it does is the fixed past uh, has a period of generation of possibilities, which I've identified with the early time of the rise of the Libet uh, experiments showing the readiness potential, that something's going on in the brain before the decision. It could well be that we're just thinking about possibilities, and then we evaluate the possibilities or the alternatives, and we make the decision, and then that uh, gives us the future. But let's go in and home in on what it is that Bob Kane was just talking about. Here it is that, well, we've generated alternatives or possibilities, we've evaluated them, and we're about to decide, but we're not yet happy. He talks about being in a torn decision condition. Uh, so we think again, okay, and we go back, and in the middle of the whole process, we generate another possibility, and we go up and we look at that and evaluate it, and maybe we then go and make that decision. Uh, in fact, I've drawn a model that um, uh, some say it's impossible to do differently in the same circumstances. So the point here is that when you come up to the same circumstances, you still may go through this uh, looping in which the possibilities are generated and then evaluated, and then one of the thoughts would be, oh, I did that the last time. Why don't I do something different this time, and then I'll be able to act differently this time. I think I have one more which describes Bob Kane's work as best I can, and that is to note that Bob wants to possibly introduce some randomness into the middle of his torn decision. And what that, to me, suggests is that uh, we've basically uh, done something which was an undetermined free act, I called an undetermined liberty, or we've, uh, the agent has made the choice and the decision, and we can describe it, uh, and, and selected one of them without any indeterminism involved in self-centered, as Bob called it. Uh, and in that case, we can call that self-determination. Okay. Um, let's see where we want to go with the rest of this talk today. Uh, we've been... Uh, looking at one of the major players in the whole um, area of free will and moral responsibility. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, I can get Bob Kane to come back up to Boston, Harvard, um, 
sometime in a couple months, April time frame, uh, when we're going to be looking at the screening of a new film uh, in which uh, Bob is interviewed and Dan Dennett is interviewed and uh, Al Mealy is interviewed, all the players that were uh, in Barcelona uh, by a young French filmmaker uh, who's made a film about whether we could, we real, have real alternatives. And in this film he imagines that we live, uh, he could live different lives based on choices and decisions. And the question is, is that really open to him? And so he tries to find the answer by interviewing uh, not just the philosophers I've mentioned, uh, but also Michael Gazzaniga, uh, Galen Strawson, who's the son of P.F. Strawson, that Bob uh, mentioned in his opening lecture, uh, famously the notion of freedom and resentment uh, in which you, we feel resentment and that doesn't have, seem to have anything to do with uh, a lack of causal processes. We just feel uh, a degree of uh, what David Hume called moral sentiments. And so uh, for Strawson, the question, he sort of changed the subject from free will versus determinism uh, to uh, the origins of moral responsibility. And he, he said there's no way we can avoid having a kind of a moral uh, attitude. Uh, and that's sort of part of uh, Dan Dennett's work to say that it's that moral competence that's the important thing, the thing that's worth wanting in human beings. And it's not a question of scientifically whether or not atoms are under the control, uh, or complete control, or are free to do slightly different things and therefore interfere with our thought processes and add crazy new ideas to our brain. Uh, my own position is uh, to agree with that to an enormous extent, but say that what I want to do is elaborate this two-stage model and just get to the case where when new possibilities are being thought about, they are just as unpredictable at some level. Uh, in particularly creative people, They're, they play an enormous role in what it means to be creative and bring new information into the world. I've shown in my work in physics that uh, uh, and communications theory, Claude Shannon's work, that new information requires uh, possibilities. If there's only one possibility, the future is already predicted uh, and, and uh, only one possible future uh, it lies out before us. Uh, we're ignorant of that future and so for some that's enough to say that makes us feel uh, good enough free. But no, to me, I want to work on the scientific problem of what's happening in the brain where we've recorded our experiences and uh, how when we have new experiences those come to um, affect our ideas about what we can do next. So I'm going to turn that music way up and then way down, get it down somewhere beneath my voice. Uh, I do appreciate your being with me today as we talk about uh, Robert Kane, uh, who I regard as the dean of all the libertarian uh, thinkers. Uh, and uh, as, when I first read his works, I basically I was encouraged that he was thinking along similar lines to my own, but I now recognize that, like most philosophers in this subject, he regards the moral responsibility part as very, very important to the problem. And uh, he distinguishes what he calls a practical need for free will. And my two-stage model, William James' model, hinted at by a dozen or almost two dozen other thinkers in my history of free will, uh, that that model is adequate for uh, non-moral, non-value-laden uh, decisions. And um, he's the expert on the connection between uh, free will and values, as we saw in this book from uh, 1985 just a few years after uh, Dan Dennett had written Brainstorms, which was, in my opinion, the very best description of the two-stage model. With the sad exception that Dan Dennett doesn't want to go along with the importance of quantum randomness in generating the new possibilities. And my question for Dan when we meet again, and he too will be here in uh, April to uh, screen this new film, which includes Dan and me and Bob Kane, Al Mealy, and five other major thinkers like Mike Kazanaga and Galen Strawson, and Max Tegmark, who is an expert on possible worlds. 
uh, and that will be uh, an exciting time to get together with them. Thank you.